Okay, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. And today I decided to combine somehow two recent results. That's why the title is, uh, let's say, convex combination between the first work that has been published in December, last December, and the uh, follow up that um, is uh, still in the submission process. Okay, so um, just to say a few things, this works, this works has been done. Lorenzo Catani, Matli, Perkins. Yeah, okay, really so le let, me, let me just uh, give you uh, 10 minutes of motivation of this research, especially for maybe. So uh, I was saying that uh, let's start with the, some basic uh, question that motivated this research. So the first question is, for what one might not be happy about quantum theory? And there might be people that say there is nothing to against quantum theory. Is a well formalist, predict everything, we know this thing. And just to fix the idea, we can say that school uh, that follow the Copenhagen interpretation, saying uh, mainly shut up and calculate, just to fix the idea, I don't want to take uh, any of this. Uh, I, I don't want to be any member of this school. So other other people might say, uh, it's famous, the Mermin's quote, uh, rather than shut up and calculate, shut up and contemplate. And what someone cannot be happy about the quantum formalism is a classical intuition, where we are not able to explain or interpret intuitively such a phenomenon. And I want to just uh, call it uh, classical explainability. So le let's see a little bit in detail uh, and what I mean by that. So we, we want a theory without no theorems. So what does it mean? It means that if we have a theorem, a theory with the no theorems, we can only say what is not. We cannot say what is it. So we have in mind the Bell theorems, for example, saying that does not exist and blah, 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 local and realistic model that describe those correlations. But we do not have a theorem that tell us what is it, what exists. So let me also mention that uh, um, we want a theory without fine tuning. By fine tuning, there are several definitions. I want to just say that our uh, uh, ad hoc parameter that we use to adjust uh, and that we use to the experimental observation with the, with the theory. Just to uh, take some example from the history of science, in the Middle Age, we had those uh, concentric sphere, as you can see, people believe or actually, the theory was that uh, oh, the outer sphere, there were angels uh, moving the stars, and the idea of angels were there just to, with the observation that the stars are moving in the night sky. Another example is uh, uh, the epicycloids epi to explain why Mars was going backwards sometimes with respect to the Earth. Now we remove this because we just decide that it's not the Earth be at the center of the solar system. And another example is this uh, Earth ether that has been solved. Then uh, let, let, let me just mention uh, how we like a theory with natu naturalness. For example, discovery of Neptune. Leverel, when he derived, when he discovered Neptune, he did it uh, simply by calculations. So then, uh, the, the same Leverel was the guy who made the, who predicted the who observed actually the um, perception of Mercury, and then because of the theory of uh, uh, Einstein was uh, so natural that was describing what is it, 
Then, in the sense uh, that I mentioned before, then we have a, a theory that not only describes what we want to as to describe, but also has uh, some uh, consequences uh, able to obtain uh, other extra results. So, and another example is also the relativity between space and time. So, I think that uh, now it's quite clear how we like and when we are happy about uh, theory. So then let's see um, uh, what, 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 uh, what are the problem then in quantum theory. So let me mention uh, one, um, one ex uh, couple of examples. And I would like to start with the Curie principle. So each of us know what is it. So we know that any asymmetry in a physical effect must be found in its causes. So basically, if we give uh, to an undergraduate uh, a problem that has to respect some symmetry, and he come back to us with a solution that violates those symmetry, we will say, well, something went wrong. Let's be back and see what, uh, what happened, where is the mistake, because symmetry has to be preserved. So just make it, let's make it, uh, let, let, let me make an example about this uh, principle. So consider this a stick and you can see that this picture is quite symmetric. And now I apply a force on the top. And then what happened is that the stick is bended on one side. So now I'm asking to you whether this is a violation of a Curie principle. And another analogous example can be with the eggs. If we take two eggs, one is bro you get break, the other not. And we can say, so I, I'm expecting that you would reply is not a violation of Curie principle because there are some micro asymmetry that are just highlighted when uh, those two eggs interact, collide each other. And now I want, I want to make the same question, but in quantum theory. So consider, let's say a star and the light propagation goes spherically. And now we reduce the entire uh, source of light into a photon. And if we want to still use the theory of the light propagation, we expect that the photon is gonna propagate also spherically. But then, if I apply a detector, be a sphere, it clicks only on one point. So now we ask again whether is this a violation of Curie principle? Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes, sure. Okay, okay. So then th these are the kind of questions that we want to ask uh, to have uh, a theory to be happy somehow. Another example, and this is going to be the last example, just to familiarize what might be the philosophical problem of quantum theory, goes with the joint measurement of incompatible observable and the Bell inequalities. So I don't want to go in the details. We know what, what those problems are, that if I observe, uh, for example, conjugated variable like momentum, then I disturb uh, the conjugative variable, uh, that is the position and vice versa, or you can consider spin, and the same is in uh, Bell inequality. So just to give the, in mind um, a picture of what are those kind of problem, I want to use the Escher portrait. This is the waterfall. And we select only a, a local part of this uh, portrait. And by looking only this part, Seems that everything fit with our intuition. You can see the, la the water is falling down and there is nothing counterintuitive according to our experience. Now I'm selecting another uh, local part of the portrait. And even here, it seems that everything is fitting with the, our common experience. And the same goes with the, the other uh, sub part. So now, since I basically uh, watched the entire portrait, I want to infer something about the global uh, uh, property, so the, the entire uh, uh, portrait. And when I watch it uh, globally, seems that 
the water is falling up, which does not match with the, our experience. So then this is a sim similarly what uh, is happening in uh, quantum theory. So now the task is to try to give an explanation and maybe by looking at this portrait, someone can say, well, there is a, some internal and the mechanism going through the walls of these structures that allows this kind of physics. So let me, let me now try to uh, provide some tools of what can be the underpinned uh, model notion kind of that give us uh, naturalness to the theory. So the ingredient that we want to use to say there is an underpinned explanation goes under the notion of non-contextuality. Let me, let me just say, I, I'm sure that uh, most of you are already familiar by contextuality. I just spent this introduction to motivate what, why people study non-contextuality. So in my opinion, my personal opinion is that uh, is an attempt to try to explain classically with this uh, classical explainability, this uh, quantum phenomenon. And specifically today, we will put the focus on preparation and contextuality. So let, let's see, let's see what, what, what is it. So consider an operational theory such that I have a preparation measurement. So preparation are basically the subject of my theory. And the measurement are the tools that I use to understand what of affair. And here I symbolically represent it with uh, some block that you can plug and uh, measure the outcome by the arrow that you can visualize uh, on the set of the measurement. And now the task is to caution. The first things that we can do is to caution the, the set of uh, preparation as follows. So let us consider an operational equivalent class for preparation such that I consider P1 and P4. Now I plug P1 with the, all of the device in the measurement set. And I do the same for P4. And if they give me the same result, basically the arrow point in the same value for P1 and P4, then there is no way to distinguish P1 from P4. So mathematically is that for M, for all of measurement, if the outcome to obtain X given M and P, the measurement M and the preparation P is equal to the one where I have a P prime, then P is equivalent to P prime. So I hope that uh, this is a quite uh, natural definition of uh, operational equivalence classes. So then I can do the same for all of the other elements. And the same can be done for the measurement, but to, it's not interesting for this talk because I promised to talk only about preparation and contextuality. And now the story, uh, just to familiarize uh, in uh, quantum theory, uh, the example is that the preparation is a density matrix. And here as an example, I choose the, the maximally mixed state. So you cannot distinguish if I give you the maximal mixed state, whether I prepared as a convex combination between zero and one, or between plus or, plus or minus uh, density matrices. And now the assumption of preparation and contextuality is the following. I want to obtain, since the only thing that I can do experimentally is looking the outcome, the probability outcome. So now I'm assuming that the, the, under, the model that reproduces this outcome is coming from a probability distribution on, on, the, on the ontic space. And so now my assumption is that for preparation on contextual model, such a probability distribution, as you can see, has to be the same. Here I just draw the same shape. And when the model is a contextual, the shape, as you can notice here, changed. You can see the difference, yes? 
So let, let me write mathematically what is this preparation on contextuality. So when P is equivalent to P prime, we have to assume that the distribution on ontic state, ontic space, has to be the same. So the distribution of mu lambda given P has to be the same to the one given P prime. So um, I want to uh, pause a little bit uh, here. I finish with my introduction. I explain basically what are uh, what is the ingredient that we are gonna use. And uh, I typically put a pictures uh, of, uh, of the day talk. Today, randomly, anniversary of the death of Pierre Curie. So then I asked to chat GPT to give me some goodbye from uh, Pierre uh, Curie. Okay, there are any questions at this point? If everything is no, clear, okay. I... sorry? You can continue. Okay, okay, okay. So now we will move on on the on uh, on the result of the paper. So now we we study specifically the uncertainty relation for in uh, this uh, uh, framework, and we know that uh, the uncertainty relation most common expression is provided by Heisenberg Roberts Robertson uncertainty relation where uh, delta A square, delta B square are uh, the variances. And here we have uh, the expectation value of commutator. But this kind of form where we take the product sometimes can be trivial. So we will be focused on the sum of uncertainty relation in quantum theory. And uh, I want to choose the simplest uh, example so we consider Pauli X and Pauli Z measurement and the uncertainty relation in this form. With the small algebraic uh, calculation, we can convert what is an uncertainty relation into a predictability relation. Indeed, this relation is telling us uh, how much we can predict about Z by knowing X, or vice versa, so there, there is a, a trade-off in, uh, in quantum uh, qubit theory, at least. So this is the relation that we are gonna study. And uh, I want to make a few examples because next to the, the qubit theory, where on the left-hand side, there's a set of preparations, on the right hand side, we have the uncertainty relation. We can repeat this, uh, let's say, task for other theories that we call it the false theories, where it has the aim to be studied in a way that we learn more about quantum theory. So the second example is a stabilizer theory. On the left, again, the set of preparation, each point is a preparation. And on the right hand side, there is uh, the uncertainty relation. And we have also the eta depolarized qubit theory, where basically we have a qubit theory when, when there is uh, some uh, decoherence. And we have also the GB theory, the one uh, just to, for the one that are familiar, the one related for, for, uh, from PR box. And you can notice that this theory has no. Uh, uncertainty, uh, uncertainty because we can know everything about X and vice versa. And this theory violates uh, no signaling. And then we have a simplicial theory, which is the one considered classical. Indeed, also this theory does not have any uncertainty relation. Indeed, we learn about uncertainty relation only when we start to study quantum theory. Classical, let's say that this can be considered the classical uh, theory. So then, then let me uh, summarize uh, all of the uncertainty relations for those theory. And on the, the third curve is the quantum one. And the fourth one is the GB, the, the one related to GB theory, uh, overlapped with uh, the classical one. And in a while, it's going to be clear why the second curve is uh, 
uh, draw with the red line. So <clears throat> the problem is the following, that how can we connect those uncertainty relation with the notion of contextuality? And the problem is the following. So uncertainty relation involved a single state, rather contextuality require uh, operational equivalences, as I show you before uh, in terms of preparation and contextuality. So we need at least four states. For those of you that uh, are not familiar uh, with the reason why it has to be four states, you can imagine to draw a triangle and each point has only one possible convex combination. But if you have uh, four extremal point, then the point can be, uh, can be drawn in two triangles. So then you can associate two different label for pointed out to the same state. So these two labels correspond to two different contexts. I don't know if I have a possibility to draw. It seems that the pen is not working on the screen. Okay, if it's not clear, I will explain later in, with, in a better way. But these are the problems. So the solution is to consider uncertainty relation for a state that satisfies the condition of A12 orbit uh, realizability. This, the name comes from uh, cortex uh, theory, is a theory in group theory. So it's not important the, the strange name, but what does it mean is important and it, it follows. So the state has an equal predictability counterpart the state manifests operationally equivalences with the such counterparts. So to make an example for qubit theory, you can say that the first assumption is that up to a sign, the expectation value has to be the same. Or you can see that S1 and S2 on the right hand side is at the same distance with respect to the axis where we perform the measurement as well as also S1 with S4, respect to the X axis is at the same distance. And so the idea why it's called the orbit, because you start from S1, you reflect respect to the X axis, then you get S4, you reflect respect to the Z axis on the plane, projected on the red plane, then you obtain S3, and by repeating, you obtain S2, and you end up again to S1. By doing that, you uh, obtain four states, and all of them has to be pointed inside the set of preparation. So the second assumption is that if we sum S1 and S3, we will, end up, we will find a point that lie on the y-axis, in the same way, how and is the same point that uh, you can obtain by sum in a convex combination S2 and S4. So this, this when when uh, we sat, when a state satisfy this condition, then we say that uh, satisfy this uh, A1 to orbit realizability. So and, and now there is the the theorem, the main theorem of this discussion. So in any operational theory, if one can find a pair of measurement, X and Z, and a state that satisfies this A12 orbit realizability, then contextuality implies, this is an if and only if, but uh, today we talk only about uh, one implication. This, uh, uh, let's say, predictability relation, or if you want a certainty relation, on the others, uh, just with a few algebraic steps, as I showed you before. Just one word to mention about the other direction. So the other direction said that uh, if this relation holds, implies there exists at least a non-contextual ontological model that reproduce the phenomenology. So, and now the question is, uh, which are these operational theories? Well, basically, we will make the same exercise as before. We will see this for the other, for the false theories that I show you before. 
So let me just say that though the, the theory such that all of the state satisfy such a condition, then we can say that the theory has a one to symmetry. And these are the theory that I explain that I show you before. And only the simplicial theory, as you can see, the exercise we did before do not match with this A1 to symmetry. Indeed, you can take the a point on the vertex of this uh, tetrahedron and realize that uh, we go out from the blue region. So, um, so then the relation between non-contextuality and uncertainty relation is such that for theories that have a one to symmetry, our bound is a constraint of the form of this uh, XZ uncertainty relation. And as I mentioned before, these are the theory and the classical one does not satisfy a one to symmetry. So, but if we take the intersection between these two figures, we realize that uh, these are exactly the point in the simplicial theory that satisfy a one to symmetry. So just to show you uh, how the intersection look like, and uh, then what, what does it mean? It means that uh, when I compare again the uncertainty relation, if I constrain the simplicial theory, the classical one, to satisfy A1 to symmetry, then quantum mechanics also satisfy A1 to symmetry. But now we can see that uh, if both satisfy this symmetry, quantum mechanics predict more than classical theory. Indeed, you can see that the classical one satisfy A1 to symmetry is uh, upper bounded by the set of circle uh, of the cube three. Okay. Giovanni, Giovanni, can you have a question? Yes, yes. So what, what is the stabilizer theory? So the, these are states stabilized by X and Z or what? Yeah, the, 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 the stabilizer theory for, um, is a well-known considered the non-contextual theory quite uh, uh, some interesting uh, phenomenology considered the quantum, but uh, we can say that is a non-contextual theory. So is this yeah, theory- wait, uh, I mean, how do you, so what, this is the, so like this octahedron or how it's called, it's like a set of states, I guess, no? Sorry, sorry, Included I didn't hear. Like, so, so the stabilizer theory is composed of like a set of states that is inside of the block sphere, but how do you define those states? Uh, let me say that this theory has its own life, has been studied, and uh, here appears uh, just as an example. And I just took the uncertainty relation of stabilizer theory. I know the only thing that uh, is important to know for this talk is that it's a non contextual theory, not because I prove it for other reason, and has its own uncertainty relation as well as simplicial theory and the intersection, actually not really the intersection. Let me say that the simplicial theory that satisfy A1 to symmetry becomes only the set of preparation of stabilizer theory. Maybe here I didn't say correctly. So look only the simplicial theory, select only the point that satisfy A1 to symmetry and then the simplicial set of uh, preparation shrink into stabilizer theory. This is the what I mean. Is it is it fine or not? No, now it's better. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Maybe the the idea to make the intersection is not. Uh, uh, yeah, it does not explain better. But th th this is the story, okay? So, and this is also the main message of the talk. You have a simplicial theory, it does not satisfy A1 to symmetry. Select only the point that satisfy A1 to symmetry, and then quantum mechanics uh, does better. So, uh, you, you obtain the same result uh, considering three measurement, but now the A1, uh, 
condition regards not four states but eight states. This is the set of uh, states in a classical theory that satisfy the condition. And we obtain a similar uh, plot in 3D, basically. So, <clears throat> and this is, uh, let's say, the non contextuality required for three measurements. And now I want to just mention that uh, uh, as a follow-up, if one consider uh, uh, the max Zender interferometer and measure the path distinguishability in the max Zender interferometer and uh, uh, visibility in the max Zender interferometer, May some of you know that uh, this goes uh, follow the relation p square plus v square less or equal than one, and uh, the first the first paper uh, about this uh, trade off between uh, wave particle duality has been derived by Jurek in the later eighties, uh, and then there is also famous PRL by Engler about this uncertainty relation. And the uh, story there is that uh, somehow they break this uh, Bohr complementary principle because at the time of Bohr, he was saying there are experiments where light behave only as a particle, like the Compton effect and so on, or only as a wave, like the young uh, two-slit experiment and so on. But with the trade-off uh, in Max Zander, we have the, there exist experiments where light behave partially as a wave, partially as a particle. And what we say more is that what is truly quantum is not the fact that light can be partially as a wave, partially as a, as a particle, but the way how it behaves. So the quantumness lie on this, uh, on this uh, let me say, slice of uh, area between the rectangle and the set of circle. Because we can recast the uncertainty relation in this experiment. Okay, I'm not saying how to do that is in the paper, but I just want to mention the, the result. So basically I answered here to, to the question. Now we can read that it is possible to provide a classical account for the trap phenomenology of quantum interference, whether for trap, uh, I mean uh, traditional regard as a problem problematic phenomenology. And here there is a, a paper uh, that uh, can be considered the father, father paper of uh, this um, talk I send you via email. However, reproducing the precise trade-off between visibility and distinguishability in quantum theory requires contextuality. So let me let me uh, show you again the picture, and let me say that we can explain using this uh, non-contextuality as a classically explainability till the point line on below the, the the line, this triangle basically. But we cannot ex classically explain the point that I draw here in these uh, slides. So, and uh, what we can do with this uh, uncertainty relation, or if we want with this interferometric uh, result, also use it as a tool to witness, uh, for example, uh, I'm running an experiment on IBM to check whether uh, this uncertainty relation in IBM lies beyond this, tri this triangle. And with this, I can finish my talk, basically, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Giovanni. Uh, now we have time for questions. So maybe I'll have like two questions. So uh, can people consider, because uh, like this, uh, I'm curious about the stabilizer theory, how you call it. So have people considered uh, generalizations to, to higher uh, dimensional Pauli groups? Like when you have like uh, Weil Heisenberg operators, do, do, you, do people consider also such uh, theories? 
Um, let, let me say that uh, uh, in this in this research, the focus on the stabilizer theory. I, as I mentioned, we just uh, took some uh, well-known fact and compare it with what we want to derive. So we didn't want to beyond what is already known about stabilizer theory. We just uh, compare what people already knew and uh, see if it match with what we found it. Okay, so I ask in a different way. So you have this relation for the uh, two Pauli operators or three, you no, know, like X and Z, that if you take their uh, expectation values squared, then they, uh, well, the sum has to be smaller or equal to one. So what happens if you consider, I don't know, D-dimensional veil Heisenberg uh, operators? Okay, can you also derive this type of relations? Yeah, this is very interesting question. And uh, I'm, I'm planning to work on it. I do not have, uh, I do not have a precise answer, but uh, for sure I'm interested to know. So I do not know because the proof of this result is quite involved. So I do not know how to show it, but uh, definitely is a interesting question. Whether you want to increase the number of measures or if you want to change the shape of uh, the set of preparation. But I do not have uh, the answer for this kind of question now. So, uh, so I'm, expect I'm expecting a kind of generalization, but. Uh, yeah, I, I sure, sure. But I was... mm -hmm. Okay. So, like, can I? So, do I understand correctly that if you violate this, for instance, this inequality for the stabilizer uh, theory, where you have like the sum of the expectation values x and z is more or equal to one, if I violate this inequality, it means that I, I have. Uh, Preparation contextuality. So my so how it is so the my preparation is contextual. Yes, it means that if you if you violate the inequality, it means that mm -hmm. uh, you cannot have you do not have does not exist any non-contextual model that reproduces those results. It's like uh, it works uh, with the same narrative of Bell inequality. Yes. You violate the inequality, you do not uh, have uh, any hidden variable theory of those correlations. And here goes in the same way. Okay, thank you. Do we have more questions? Let me comment it a little bit. Uh, as I show you, the idea to build a theory with the naturalness we, by using uh, non contextuality is not enough because non contextuality reproduce many things about quantum theory, but does not beat quantum theory in a way that you do not have any more novel theory. Because here you violate the, the inequality, which basically can be written as a novel theorem. So the dream is to obtain an equivalent notion or you know, the same uh, way to think, but not non-contextuality, something else in a way that you can reproduce maybe quadratic uh, trade-off. So this is the idea. Uh, so I, I would have uh, another question related to to this theory. So what do you understand here as a theory? It's like it seems to be this just a, a set of probabilities or something. Huh? There, there are. Do you also involve some uh, unitary operations? I don't know. I, as a theory, as a theory, I, I mean this informalism of a general probabilistic set of preparation, measurement, the the rules that. Uh, give probability, and when you want to study the dynamics, I, I, I repeat again. So I, I was saying that uh, by a theory, I mean uh, in the sense of a general probabilistic theory, where you have a set of preparation, set of measurement effect, then you have also set of transformation, and then you need uh, uh, the analog of the Born rule to compute probability and to predict the update state after uh, the measurement process. So once you give this, uh, once you define these five points, then you define a theory in the operational sense. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have more questions? So I think we can end up end up the session. Thank you for all of us and thanks the speaker again. See you. See you. See you. Thank you. Bye bye.